five is well done. Dr. Cortez Rojas, uh, Rojas Cortez does a nice job here of putting uh, together some important things. Uh, obviously, she brings her agenda in, and you'll hear me whine a number of times about that through the chapter. But it's really some interesting things, how to get acquainted, uh, how to provide services to parents. Uh, like so many things in this textbook, it's all about the lowest uh, income folks is what it's set up for, the minority groups, and not, uh, not a lot of people you'll see. But uh, a very good chapter, and I hope you enjoy, and uh, please forgive all my whining. Chapter 5. Effective Homeschool Community Relationships. Uh, President Barack Obama, in his State of the Union in 2011, the responsibility begins not in our classrooms, but in our homes and communities. It's the family first that instills the love of learning in a child. That's great, and he did a great job delivering this. Uh, you'll find this chapter uh, really uh, goes towards the other end of this the whole time, and that is that pa parents won't be involved. And you'll see again uh, the, edit, the author's bias here of what the family is like. And uh, if you'll allow me some liberties, I'll point those out. She does a great job laying out possibilities here. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, take off here. The overview is, uh, first of all, the parental attitudes towards school and, and what re relationship you'll have with that the roles that parents can play, how you can enhance those, and that this chapter does a great job with that. Uh, school activities and resources and gives you tons of ideas for that. It gives you ideas on teacher communications and then uh, talks about uh, how to make them partners, ideas you can give them how to contribute at home and build this uh, family strength. And, and then the last part of it about school volunteers. And again, what uh, unnerves me a little bit is the assumption that parents won't do these things that you need to uh, bring those to them. So let's uh, let's take off here in the textbook first, if you would. I'll have a number of places I want you to become involved. And here is the chapter uh, objectives that I also have on the course wiki. Uh, that uh, that's up. Um, schools often are used to include all levels of care and education. And first of all, it talks about this parent-school cooperation. And this has been long demonstrated that partnership will strengthen the effectiveness of the center or, or school. And in this chapter, they'll uh, vacillate back and forth between center and school because it really, uh, this also speaks to preschools, as you see the little one here in the picture on the right, as much as it does to school age. So that's where a number of this came, comes from here. And there uh, says that, uh, you know, these are all the researchers that have agreed with this down here at the bottom of this statement that is parent-school partnerships are highly needed from birth through high school. What the research also tells us is it starts off pretty strong but by middle school it really dissipates and by high school parent involvement really disappears. Um, so lots of reasons for that. So first of all school climate. What is school climate? And uh, you're going to have to, there's some questions on the test about school climate. And it really is this uh, feeling that people get from the school. Uh, it starts off here when to walk to school, preschool, or child center. You get a sense of, of its spirit. Does it seem to invite you in, or does it make you feel unwelcome? Now, I've told you before, I have visited, uh, I'd hate to guess, I'm going to say at least 100 schools, if not more in my years uh, observing student teachers and I would concur with this that you get a certain feeling uh, it, it may be first impressions but when you walk in you get a certain sense and so uh, what I'm going to ask you to do here uh, right away on this one here is uh, come in on right away a number one up here and uh, Tell me about your formal schooling. This is number one here. Is what about, uh, you know, the climate at the school where you went to school? Or you could substitute if you have children in your children's school. But was it a positive climate? Let's go back here and see what those things are. Uh, can you pinpoint the reasons you're feeling each school difference in its character? Some come enjoy this. Uh, some say, come enjoy this exciting business of education. Others say, you're infringing on my territory. So I want you to judge right there on number one, the climate of your school when you were in school. And then it goes on to talk about the different uh, attitudes that parents bring to, uh, to the school 
from their growing up years. Um, what I want you to do is do a little investigation of these right here, of the different groups. And there's a several questions on the test about uh, how this comes to be and what these are, what they look like. It gives you a scenario and say which they fit into. From the top one here, who have parents who avoid schools like the plague, and uh, and there's some descriptions in here of each of these. So please understand these. To the extreme one, a couple enjoy involvement in schools, or even this one, uh, who enjoy power and o overactive uh, in the school setting. And it has some uh, drawings here that kind of explain those in Figure Five One. And so, um, if I'm going to uh, uh, show you that. Okay, and please investigate this on your own of those. They avoid it like the plague, they need encouragement, readily spawn invited, and enjoy overpower are just comfortable. And each one of us have this, have, uh, have a place here, and it depends a lot on our climate, uh, the climate of the school that you help create. And so uh, that's pretty well done. Then the roles uh, in, of involved parents. Let's look at the roles of the administrators. Um, gives you two things. Uh, read these here. Uh, welcome Bobcats starting new school year and it's just kind of giving you an idea which vignette will your school centerpiece represent as you look at those two different approaches. This has a lot to do with school climate. Uh, I could go into long uh, orations of them. One, uh, you know, just the first time we walked into Jackson's new school uh, where he attends now, the feeling I got. And uh, I can just say it wasn't as positive as I thought it would have been. Okay. So how about the administrator's role in, in school? Think of your principles that you knew uh, when you were in school. Well, they have several. One is that of a spirit of the school. They have a lot to do with that. They're the program designer of what happens. Their third role is they, they create this relationship with the parents, a principal-parent relationship. They're the program coordinator for what goes on in there. And finally, they're the leadership role in developing the site-based management. That's a buzz we'll talk about a little bit later. And it talks about this here. Create school atmosphere, serve as program designer, develop administrator's parent relationship, serve as a program coordinator, and the school leadership management team. So the administrators have this role, and unbelievable how an administrator, a principal, can affect the climate and the progress of the school. A critical school leadership, as there's so many. And here's your teacher's role, facilitator. These are all the things you can a counselor, a communicator, a program director, an interpreter, resource developer, and a friend uh, in addition to teacher. Uh, interpreter, it's interesting here, and it doesn't mean for heart hearing impaired. It means for culturally different people. Understand social inequities to better reach, communicate with families. Uh, need to be aware of their own attitude toward parents. So here's number two uh, thing you're going to do in this one, and that is this. Uh, I want you to look up the definition of this and put that right here. And you'll see Dr. Rojas uh, Cortez's uh, uh, activist uh, approach again to this is why this is in here. Just is unbelievable to me what that has to do with this. But this is the biggest change from the last edition of the textbook. It's this constant integration of a, her agenda. And it is the social inequity. So you write me a description or a meaning right here what she's talking about here. Okay. Let's go back and look at uh, a, a little bit about that. So here's the teacher's roles, the communicator, program director, interpreter, resource developer, and then she goes on here. Here's the thing to assess yourself. Uh, here's the thing, uh, teachers' attitudes and feelings, that you must be aware of how you feel towards these parents. And I'm going to ask you to look at these uh, 
things right here and determine how you feel a little bit about it. And it really depends where you're teaching. And that's, again, she doesn't stake that out. She just assumes that you'll all work in low income, highly uh, integrated by uh, uh, immigrants. And so uh, this is how she uh, approaches it. But um, this is the rest of th this here. And it says how they feel about collaboration through this. And if you look through this, how you feel about collaboration. And this affects me as the parent. Do you listen to what we're saying? Encourage us to drop in. Uh, some of you will be very comfortable with that. Others will be terrorized if there's parents in and around. Uh, they have an opportunity to contribute to the class. They have written handouts to enable parents to participate in the classroom. In other words, you have extra handouts. Uh, send newsletters home, contact parents before school begins in the fall. Here I want you to look at these 25 things uh, and see where you fit on this scale here. Of those. And, and again, nothing will happen to this other than it will help you create awareness about yourself as a teacher. Like here, think of this one. Now, open and honest with parents is can you tell it like it is, or do you have to sugarcoat it and soften it? Can you tell them what the struggles are uh, without being whiny and complainy? Okay. And here's that goes into this role of parents, and one obviously is room parent. And I served for room parents for four years, and uh, what room parents we did was uh, we put on the school parties. My kids were in private school at that time. And we did, we're in charge of all the parties to uh, orchestrate them and, or, and uh, put them together. And we just had a ball. We always made homemade uh, snacks and treats to bring and played games. And I miss that. It was a great. And it also gave me real insight to what's going on in the class. Uh, goes uh, on and say, increasing parents are serving as more regularly scheduled resources to the school. A huge movement in that direction. You'll find others uh, making books and children's stories or listening to children, reading, discussing ideas with them. And I think this is an excellent uh, idea, for especially for volunteers like grandparents. Now, it, she does do a nice thing here about employed parents because that's where we were. We weren't free to just be in there all the time. And my kids went to school with lots of lots and lots of parents that were moms or full-time moms. And so they had a lot more flexibility. And at times, I was critical of their school of not being open enough to us that we were both working, that it really was set up. And the whole program was run for parents that were home, where their mother was home. So uh, that uh, that what you'd consider, and again, depends where you teach and stuff, that you'd have to know your school to know how to involve these parents. But there's gives you a number of ideas here. This is interesting, too, and this is Dr. Cortez Rojas uh, Cortez here. Parents may also help make policies. For example, school boards have been composed of community leaders charged with making educational policy for many years. This is her statement. Early control of schools was accomplished by community leaders who were generally the elite of the area. Now, that's not true. And where she got that, she has nothing here to back that up. Uh, she just throws that in there. And I, I, don't, I don't like that. Kind of <laughs> I don't like that. Why would you say that? To say, oh, if you're elite, then you don't belong here or whatever. I, I disagree. But she does state this and backs up 50% of advisory councils and Head Start must be composed of parents served by human, uh, by the program. But this here I have in yellow is, I, I don't know where that comes from. That's just an agenda-driven statement. Uh, parent involvement, including input in the program, is recommended. But this representative member uh, has reached down to grassroots. And she does a nice job talking about that. Collaborative decisions is, is a buzz in schools. Brings parents and children to schools together, decision making progresses. So then, um, here's the thing a role, possible roles of the parents, which is great. Uh, it has that too in our notes, uh, possible roles of them. Uh, need their own awareness. And here there's can be uh, this possible roles of those parents, spectators. Uh, teachers, volunteer sources, policy makers, employed resources, those types of things. So how can we enhance those uh, relationships?
most of the uh, often leadership of the administration uh, have a lot to do with this. <coughs> Schools or centers usually do not change overnight, but gradually school, home, and community can come united in an effort. Okay. That's very important. This is interesting, too. Uh, we'll come back to this later, this questionnaire of what their needs are. I want to set here the focus of five areas of this communication center, school atmosphere, and involvement of parents, activities and resources, contact early in the year, meeting the needs of the school, and volunteers. Okay, So multiple methods of communication, and you know a lot of them. We've talked about them. It lists us here like websites, blogs, uh, forums. You know, Obviously, that the note home, and it talks about this simple note home is still one, but uh, for the most part, uh, again, in uh, Dr. Cortez Rojas's world, that maybe works, but for the most part, where you'll be teaching, these newer versions of communication uh, will be preferred. At least they are for me. Uh, hand notes I may or may not see hand things that come out of that school bag. And after I see it, I may or may not be able to lay my hands on it again. And why I like these digitized new things is because I can have access to them even away from home. And that's where I'm saying, like in my other school, it wasn't set up for working parents, it was set up for home parents. And that's what Dr. Cortez, Rojas Cortez here is deferring, assuming people will not be working. And a lot of her uh, agenda is that. Okay. So think of people like me that need that digitize. Uh, it gives you a scenario here, says what's, what the problem here with this new school. Uh, you can look through that. And then it goes into this open door policy. And I'm sure that implies some things, and you have a, an understanding just here on that term. But if an open door welcoming policy is uh, an attitude of the school, more an attitude of the school is what that is. So, uh, And it's more than activity, it's just an attitude that you can come in. What it means is you can come in uh, without an appointment. You know, if you come only by request or appointment, it doesn't give you that feeling uh, of being open. And some schools will say they have an open door policy, but they don't really. You'll find in a number of uh, schools, especially our bigger ones, the principals are so heavily scheduled that they don't have time to just sit down. And same with you as a teacher, that you may not have time to meet with parents whenever they walk in. But an open door policy will still communicate that to parents that their input and stuff is valued. Uh, parents can give suggestions and get answers. School personnel can ask questions and clarify. By establishing an open door policy early, the climate is set for parents and school to work together on behalf of rather than suffer a confrontation over a child. Okay, that's open door policy. And then this parent advisory council site-based management uh, it's mandatory in uh, you know Title I and, and the Secondary Ed Act. And I was involved in this when I was taught in the middle school. I was part of the site council, a group uh, of teachers and uh, outside personnel that get together and decide about direction and focus of not the school district, the school building, when you have multiple buildings. And site base has been established in schools across the nation. And you may or may not be asked to do that. And here's some of the things that you could do uh, who could be involved are uh, teachers, school pe personnel, and community representatives. Uh, so it can also be known as site-based councils. And then the strategy for supporting and em uh, evolving culturally and linguistic diversity families. And it goes through this here, the, the involvement, engagement, uh, empowerment of those. I want to go back here and talk about this. Uh, newsletters, websites, workshops. Here's that open door policy, these advisory councils, and um, homeschool continuity. Let's, uh, uh, let me go back and, and look at those now from the textbook. Here's the homeschool continuity. It says that between home and school is necessary. Important support system of the families today. President Obama eloquently explained the importance of continuity and State of the Union in 11. Says it's a share, we share this responsibility. And what's so interesting, again, to me is most families you don't need to tell this to. This is t talking to a different group. I'm telling you, where my kids go to school, you would not have to convince any of them of this. 
and yet here it is as we're studying. But you, uh, if you're teaching in a low-income school that is, has lots of new uh, Americans, new people to this country, this will be a part of it. And this is why it's so important to understand uh, parents' approaches to school if you're teaching in the low-income school. Schools share the responsibility and they walk in the classroom. I would agree. A good way to improve relationships is a needs assessment or survey to determine what the families in the school are, uh, area desire. This is on the test, this exact question. Please know that. The questionnaire should earlier, uh, and it was back here, uh, a couple is the questionnaire that you may use or a sample of it. And again, I'm telling you, in my school, this would not be necessary because people are assertive enough to speak. Dr. Rojas Cortez uh, has a different assumption of the type of school that you'll teach in. And you realize in here again, look at her image here. The images all kind of look the same. They're not, you know, they are not representative of our schools. They're representative of her schools. And she's saying here again, it should be culturally relevant. And this is her agenda. So it's very interesting. I just want to keep pointing that out to you. Uh, continuity needs to be a cooperative effort. Continuity outreach uh, continues to help families even when school is not in session. Okay, and this again, this uh, full service school type thing is I don't expect anything from my school when it's not in session, but she does. They would You would have recreation programs, library services in the summer over the break. You know, a lot of our schools uh, serve uh, breakfast in the summer and stuff. That kind of that uh, that uh, that type of approach, um, but it gives a number of ideas how that can be uh, this continuity between home and school. In other words, the, what Dr. Rojas Cortez's agenda is: the school should do more to raise the child. Okay, I disagree. I want strong academic instruction. You don't need to raise my child. And then a family center says, or a place within the school where the parents can meet, share information, work, and relax. Ideally, parents will have a room similar to the traditional haven, the teacher's lounge, as well as space in within each classroom. And that is a phenomenal idea. And when you're r running your school, I would set this up. I would have a teacher's lounge and a parent's lounge. And then I would have a, uh, an area in each classroom, if there's room, where it's a parent area, where they can work and leave stuff. Family room should be stocked with for parents like, uh, you know, coffee, soft drinks, microwave, telephone, all the things you'd have in the teacher's lounge would be in there. And that's uh, a, a very idealistic uh, approach. And I love this part here. The teacher's, uh, parent's room implies that parents are expected to be uh, in the building, that they will accept them. So school activities and resources, the following school activities and resources encourage parent participation, uh, like back to school nights, uh, shared reading, uh, those things. Um, all these here are quite an exhaustive list of things you can do. And I just want you to look through these, if you would, and see what your, your thoughts of each one to put on fairs and carnivals. And obviously, this is an exhaustive list, but it'd be great to do some. Uh, some of the things, and you be involved as a teacher setting these up, a career day, bring outside people. Again, when you think of career day, it's often geared towards low-income, uh, minority-driven uh, schools. Uh, but it could be a lot of fun. Okay, and then teacher communications. Let me come on over here to parents as partners in education at home, and this is uh, I think can be a strength for you to uh, put the help put this together uh, and look at figure five and six. But what can we do to bring them in? Uh, first thing, it starts out talking about a reading program. And just about all schools have this. Reading at home throughout the year is encouraged. Uh, these things illustrate a way to get parents involved in a home reading program. And my kids, ever since they were started school, have had reading programs that parents are involved with. In other words, they have to read at home. Uh, you give this explanation at a back to school night or some kind of a, a summer thing where you tell about r what kind of reading program you're going to have that encourages it. Here's a couple sample letters about it. Okay. And then it goes into this thing contacts early in the school year in a number of ways that uh, many, many teachers found that early contact uh, well worth its time it takes even in the summer. And uh, we thought both ways that my kids loved getting a note from their teacher from last year. 
but it was just ex exciting to get uh, contact from them for the, co the new teacher they're coming into. So letters in August, neighborhood visits, uh, bus trips, uh, picnics, and some of these might be a little extreme. And then it says what works. Parents' behaviors that support the child's cognitive development include this. Okay. All right. Let's go back to Epstein here a little bit. Their parents help them. Uh, children do better if their parents help them. Teachers and principals show greater respect to parents who participate in school activities. When teachers involve families, their uh, rate of parents more positively uh, go up. Uh, work at home with one subject, uh, uh, for example. Uh, parents are able to influence and make a contribution. Uh, these are excellent things with Epstein here. And then he goes on to say, what can you do? Parents can do many things in a home and school. Their children succeed in school. They do this through the daily conversations. Household routines, uh, attention to uh, school matters, affectionate uh, concerns, those things. Read and talk, listen to them, tell them stories, play games, share hobbies, discuss news, all these things. Parents stay away of their children's lives at school when they discuss school events. Stay aware of them, I should say. <laughs> stay away. Um, help children meet deadlines, these things. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those later. Then how about meeting the needs of your school area? It talks about worksite seminars, telephone trees, emails, blogs, those types of things that you could do. Uh, transportation, parent-to-parent -parent support, child care, crisis nurseries um, and after school activities and, and very few schools now don't have some kind of an after school program a lot was funded by the federal government uh, low cost just about everybody my kids went to it again I'm saying look at this uh, not here here's a, a a white kid here but other than that uh, the, the supervisor of this after school program looks like uh, Latino possibly uh, a very interesting portrayal again about Rojas Cortez it goes on here, this family literacy program, skills training, uh, things. Um, and emotional educational support for the homeless. And again, she, uh, she makes a big uh, thing of that of the notes, too. And uh, I'm glad she does, folks, but I'm telling you, you probably will teach your entire career and not have children that are truly homeless. Um, but interesting. It goes through this of being homeless. Okay. Read, talk, uh, school events, help children talk about school problems. Here's Epstein's thing. It's all out of Epstein's stuff there. And then this goes into volunteers. A variety of volunteering options will allow more parent participation in short and long term. should be meaningful and appreciated by parents. And that's what your challenge will be, is what's meaningful help? What can they do that are meaningful? Gives you some ideas how to, how to uh, recruit here. Sign-up sheets, invitations, announcements. Uh, describe positions so parents can choose an area based on their strengths. And here's what I'm going to tell you about I know about volunteering. If you want people to volunteer, you have to directly ask them. You get to know these parents a little bit, and you look them in the eyes and say, can I get you to help me with this? Sign-up sheets help, and there will be a number of active ones, uh, but my wife worked with a nonprofit for 25 years, and I'm telling you, when you look people in the eyes and ask them to help is when they come forward. Okay, I think that's enough of this. Chapter 5. Let me go back to the text quickly here. Make sure I didn't miss anything there. Building family strengths. I say I'm going to ask you to do something with this a little bit later. And this is about volunteers. Used or users. There's several uh, questions on the test about volunteering. So you make sure you want to read the, that. And there's this whole chapter. Even though it's long, 
It's about a 25-page uh, thing. It reads pretty fast. There's some blanks in it, but you'll want to read this because the, the test covers a number of things that I flew over pretty fast. How to recruit here. Um, that's The questions are about what to have them do. Here's some teaching tasks, what they can do invitation to share, field trips, what they can do. Here's some things. This is an excellent thing here of how to solicit help. It gives you ideas what they can do. Reading is a big one. They can always use help reading. School things help children prepare and practice speeches. This part's phenomenal and you want to involve parents. Even those of us that work We'd still love to come and do very specific things uh, for you.